Hello, loved ones. Thank you for joining me as we look to God's Word again. You know, I've been in pastoral ministry now for about 35 years, and I've preached a lot of funeral messages from a lot of different Bible passages. But you know, whenever I do a graveside service, I almost always go to the same passage because one day an event will take place from every gravesite of every believer. And that's the passage where we are today. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 18. I believe that these are some of the most powerful and most reassuring words of comfort and hope for those who are in Christ Jesus. Paul wrote these words because some of the Thessalonian believers were confused about their Christian friends who had died before the rapture of the church. They were troubled by the idea that they may miss out on some of the blessing of that great future event. They believed in the imminent return of Christ, and they believed that it would happen in their lifetime, and they tried to live in anticipation of it. You remember in chapter 1, Paul commended them saying how they turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God and waited for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. They had no idea what would happen to their loved ones since they died before the rapture happens. So Paul taught them the truth about what happens to believers who die. And loved ones, God does not want us to be ignorant about what lies beyond the grave for believers. And so he directs the Apostle Paul to explain, to explain very clearly for them and for us what will happen to believers who have died before Jesus returns, as well as for those who are alive at that time. He says in verse 13, But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as those who have no hope. You know that old saying, ignorance is bliss? Well, that does not apply when it comes to what happens after you die. Some people believe that we can't know until it happens, but loved ones, you can if you believe God. People will say, well, Pastor Mike, you know, we can never really know for sure, can we? And I say, yes, we can. So keep listening, and I'll tell you why. He uses sleep here as a metaphor for those Christians who have died. Their soul has gone on to heaven, but their body is sleeping until the day of resurrection. And sleep is not a fearful thing for us, is it? As a matter of fact, most of us really look forward to a good night's sleep. Death is nothing for the Christian to fear. In fact, the psalmist says, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. You know, there are few things more precious than seeing your child sleeping. And death is precious to the Lord because it is the means of his children to enter into his presence. 2 Corinthians 5.8 says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And so Paul leaves us these words, first of all, to give us hope. Now you can grieve, but not hopelessly. Because Paul says, I'm going to tell you why. Verse 14, he says, For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. Now, if you don't believe Jesus died and rose again for your sins, then you have no hope. The reason we Christians can know what happens to us after we die is simply because Jesus went before us and he came back. He died and he rose again. He ascended back into heaven and he promised that he's coming again. And when he returns, he will, bring, he will be bringing the souls of all those who have died with him. Every person who has died in Christ does not yet have their permanent bodies. Evidently, the soul takes on some form so that they can see and communicate and recognize one another, but it's not their permanent body. When Jesus returns at the rapture, they will be coming with him. And verse 15 says, For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. So first of all, he assures them that this is the word of the Lord. This is coming directly from God. He tells them not to worry about those who have gone on to be with the Lord, because they're actually going to be the first to respond. In verses 16 and 17, 
give us a pretty concise explanation of how this event is going to go down. Now, let me just say that I know Christians disagree on the timing of the rapture. There are a lot of different ideas, but there are two basic schools of thought. Some believe Jesus is coming at the beginning of the seven-year tribulation period at the rapture. He's going to take the church, also called the bride. He's going to take it home to be with him, pictured in John chapter 14 and verses 1 through 3. Then after seven years during which the Antichrist is wreaking havoc on the earth and God is bringing his wrath against Israel and the world, Jesus returns with his church. He sets foot on the Mount of Olives destroys his enemies, restores Israel, he casts Satan into the abyss, and he sets up his millennial kingdom. Now this is called pre-tribulationalism. So it presents the return of Christ in two phases, seven years apart, the rapture first, meeting his saints in the air, then his return with his saints seven years later to set up his thousand-year reign on the earth, after which is the great white throne judgment, Satan is cast into the lake of fire. Now, that's the view I believe the Bible teaches. The other major belief is that the church will go through the tribulation, and the rapture and his glorious appearing happen almost simultaneously. This is called post-tribulationalism. Now, if you happen to be a post-tribulationalist, all I can say is that one day you will be very glad that you were wrong. And I hope you can take a joke. But now let me add this in all sincerity. Whatever view you hold, let us be united over the fact that Jesus is coming again. And may we all love his appearing. Amen. So let's look at what verse 16 and 17 says. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus shall we always be with the Lord. Now the word rapture doesn't actually occur in the Greek. It comes from the Latin word for caught up in verse 17. For 2,000 years, believers have been expecting Jesus to return and We've often been mocked for it, especially because there have been several foolish date setters through the years, despite what Jesus said about no man knowing the time. Now, we don't know when, but we definitely can see signs that indicate that the time is near. But now, when we're talking about an eternal God, remember, a thousand years to him is like the blink of an eye. However, I do have to say that I believe so much Bible prophecy has come true that the evidence is pretty compelling, compelling enough that it ought to convince the most fair-minded person that if they would honestly evaluate the evidence of the resurrection of Jesus and fulfilled prophecy, that they would see that it is actually history now. After all, history is his story. Now, I know we live by faith, but loved ones, We've got plenty of evidence to support what we believe. This is not a blind faith. We may not have seen Jesus or God with our eyes, but the evidence of his reality is it's etched in the universe, on his creation, in science, in history, and in the lives of men and women who have been transformed by his power. Only fools deny his existence, the Bible says. Well, anyway, first, the Lord descends from heaven, accompanied by the spirits or souls of those believers who have already died. And there's a shout with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet of God. Now, we could consider this sort of a wake-up call, if you will, to those dead bodies which sleep. John said in, or Jesus said rather in John chapter 5, an hour is coming when all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come out. And perhaps a summoning of those who are alive as well. The sound of the trumpet was also used to rally God's people in Exodus when they were to meet with God. And it could also be a warning to those unbelievers who do not know that the day of the Lord is about to come. The prophet Joel said this, he said, Blow a trumpet in Zion and sound an alarm on my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble for the day of the Lord is coming. Surely it is near. A day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness. Joel chapter 2 and verse 1 and 2. 
And so they were all decisive signs that the Lord has come for his saints. But notice the order here. The dead in Christ will rise first. Now, when I'm doing that graveside message for a Christian, I want that family to be absolutely sure that their loved one's body will rise up from that very spot. Now, don't worry, they're not going to look like zombies. Paul describes what happens to their bodies and ours in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 51 through 53, when he says this, he says, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all, we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall all be changed. For this corruptible shall put on incorruption, and this mortal shall put on immortality. Now their bodies are coming out of the grave incorruptible and immortal and perfect. These will be our glorified bodies that are fit for eternity. And those of us who are still alive when it happens, we're going to be instantly transformed. In the twinkling of an eye, with all those believers, we will be caught up. All those believers that have died over the last 2,000 years, they're going to be risen out of their graves, and we're going to be united with them. Now, their bodies somehow may have disintegrated. I don't know how, but God will somehow reconstitute their bodies, give them glorified bodies for every single believer. Whether we're alive or dead when Christ returns, all believers in Christ have the same hope of being raptured in glorious immortal bodies to be with the Lord forever and ever and ever and ever. And like S.M. Lockridge said, when you get through all those forevers, then amen. And that's our hope, brothers and sisters. But it is a hope that is certain because it is based on a promise from a resurrected Savior who cannot lie. And so Paul says, therefore, comfort one another with these words. Loved ones, I've lost a lot of friends and family to death. Many of them have left an indelible mark on my life, and I miss them dearly. And sometimes I even weep when I think about them because I miss them so much. But for those that put their trust in Jesus Christ, who believe that Jesus died for their sins at Calvary, that he was buried and that he rose from the grave and is coming again, I know that I'm going to see them again someday. My hope is certain because it is based on the fact of Jesus' resurrection. I say again, the historical evidence is so overwhelming and undeniable that it can be proven in any court of law using the rules of evidence. He told Martha before he raised Lazarus from the grave, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? I hope you do, my friend. I know I do. And so I know I will meet my Lord someday and my family and my friends on that great day that we call the rapture of the church. One way or another, whether we've died or we're still alive, if we are in Christ, we will be changed and taken up. So Paul's words here are a great comfort to me and I hope to you. I don't fear death. And you need not either, friend, if you know Jesus Christ. Death comes to everyone until the Lord comes. But sooner or later, we'll all have to deal with it. Somebody you know will die. Somebody you love will die. How will you grieve? Will there be hope and certainty to give you comfort? Or will there be uncertainty and anxiety and just a sense of utter hopelessness because you have no idea what lies beyond the grave? And I would plead with you, friend, 
If you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, put your trust in him today. Only he can forgive you of your sin. Believe that he died for you and rose again. Believe it with all of your heart. And if you want to know more, friend, if you'll contact me at lbcdoulos at gmail.com, I'll be more than happy to respond and tell you anything you want to know about our Lord Jesus. Let's pray. Loving Father, only you can convince people of their need of a Savior. I pray the Holy Spirit would open hearts to receive Christ. May our hearts be drawn to you. If there are anyone, if there's anyone that was listening that fears death, may they find the truth and discover the hope and the comfort that can only be found in Christ. Father, draw them to the Savior. We pray and ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, friend, God bless you. Thank you for joining me. I hope this has been an encouragement to you. This is a, a passage of scripture that is special to me. And uh, I pray that you be a blessing to someone for Jesus. So until next time, goodbye. <laughs>